Hello, I'm Gabby Mendez. And I'm Felix Cabute Jr. You are now listening to the Talk 20s podcast. This podcast is your ultimate guide to adult life, where we discuss with the help of our amazing guests, all the things that we were never taught in school. Adult life can be really isolating as everyone's got their own thing going on. But remember, you're never alone. There are over 7 million of us 20-somethings all trying to figure it out. Let's unpack a new topic in today's episode. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Talk 20s podcast. This one right here is a Valentine's special. So we just want to say how much we love receiving your messages. I've got one right here from Pepsi, shout out Pepsi, who messaged us to say, I saw Gabby's viral TikTok video about long-term relationships and it resonated with me so much. I'm 29 and we've been with my partner for 10 years and the advice was bang on. I then had a little look at Talk 20s and I see what you're doing is so awesome. I had to reach out. Thanks Pepsi for that message. And we're really only just getting started. So make sure you follow and subscribe to follow the journey. Absolutely. We love getting messages like that from you guys. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about self-worth in relationships, dating and getting married to a stranger with none other than Married at First Sight's Sophie Brown. Hey, Sophie, welcome to the podcast. It's amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. You're welcome. Hello. Yeah, it's amazing to be here and on the Valentine's special. <laughs> so we're going to be talking a lot about relationships, getting married. It's a thing that lots of people do in their 20s. So it feels very relevant to be talking about it on the Talk 20s podcast. But I think the question on everybody's lips and even producer Jacob has asked you this question <laughs> literally the moment you walk through the door. <laughs> but the question on everyone's lips is, what on earth, why on earth did you want to marry a stranger? Yeah, I mean, it sounds crazy when you say it out loud, but I honestly, I feel like it was one of those things. Dating for me wasn't really working for a few different reasons. I felt in a place in my life where I was fully ready to kind of open up, you know, kind of get with someone, get, I mean, get married to someone. I was ready for a long-term relationship. Um, and I just thought maybe it should be taken out of my hands. Maybe the experts should pick someone for me. Clearly I'm not doing a very good job myself. And yeah, I mean, I love my independence, but equally who doesn't want to be, you know, everybody wants happiness, everyone wants mm -hmm. love. And whatever way you kind of chase that dream, I guess mine was to you get them to pick someone for me and yeah, mm -hmm. get married. And there is proof that it works because there are some couples from the show that are still very happily in love. Like mm. there's some, there's a couple from like season one of the the new style of Married at First Sight and I think they've got like a baby and stuff yeah. like that. And there's the Australian versions and there's loads of them that have worked out. So who's to say it can work. Exactly. I feel like in my head as well, I had such a positive mindset about it. Mm. I was so open to it. And I honestly thought, that it, I thought it would be the love of my life and I'd have kids with this person. I was I was all in. So I think I committed everything to it, not thinking that anything bad would happen. Mm -hmm. And like mm. one of the questions that a lot of people ask is, is it a legal wedding? Like, are you legally married to this person? What's the situation in that department? So many people ask me this. They're like, oh, so are you still married? Did you get divorced? So it's not a legal marriage. Um, but I always say I would have done it if it was. I mean, I was already all in. Once you bought like a white dress, my mm. dad walked me down the aisle. It was as real as it could have been. So yeah, I feel like, you know, putting my name on paper to that. I committed to the relationship. So why not sign my life away, I guess? Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. She's amazing. <laughs> So amazing to have you on, Sophie, but I'll be honest, I've not watched the show. <laughs> I have to be honest, but the concept of marrying at first sight sounds really interesting. So I think I'm going to have to go back and watch some, <laughs> some previous seasons. But I do know that you were matched up by the producers with a guy called Jonathan, and mm. he was a joiner from Yorkshire, right? Mm -hmm. you've, come, you've since coming off the show, you said that how he looks on TV is a lot different to how it actually is in real life, especially the whole um, wedding, how it took place. Mm. Um, what's it actually like? And what were your initial thoughts about Jonathan? Because I remember you said the first thing, the first time you saw him was at the altar. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I saw him, I saw him from behind. Um, I thought, oh my gosh, he's tall. And that's what I thought, you know, I wanted like looks wise, but I'm such a personality person. We clicked straight away. I mean, mm. I felt so comfortable. When I walked down the aisle, I could see his family. They were all super attractive. I was like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? <laughs> um, and he turned around, he had a really warm smile. And I think throughout that day, we really got to know each other. I think it was difficult watching it back because... 
I'm a very sort of independent, career-driven woman. Um, and he, on the other hand, is much more kind of, well, we're both family orientated, but he's less kind of driven and ambitious. He has different goals in life. And I feel like that was a very kind of big focal point for our relationship. So very much on that wedding day, I think they focused on the whole, you know, I went in there like, I want someone similar to me. And he was very different. And they kind of played that played that off a bit. But from the first vibes and, you know, the first day meeting each other, I mean, the wedding was spectacular. Our family were dancing with each other. It was just, it was just a really good time. And I feel like you'd think you'd be super, I don't know, uncomfortable. And I watched some of the other weddings and they were really uncomfortable with each other. So I know it can happen, but yeah, that day was amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you you looked really happy and like honeymoon (laughs) went well, like kind of (laughs) watching the series, which is like, you know, super positive. Uh But I think like you, you kind of alluded to it then that there was a lot of conversations around wealth and ambition in a relationship, in the Mm. relationship and within your relationship in particular. Mm. How important do you think that actually is for a relationship to actually thrive? Like, do you think that is really important to have those kind of shared values looking back? I feel like for me, it's just that it's shared values. And it was always about, it was never about someone's job title or anything like that. It was about their attitude and their ambition and their goals. You know, that's something that I want to speak about with a partner. I want us both to uplift each other and be one another's biggest fans. You know, I've had it before where guys have felt, I don't know, maybe a little intimidated or they felt like, you know, they weren't doing as well in their career and that meant that they didn't want to support me. And that just doesn't, that doesn't work for me. Um, But it's just about attitude. And I feel like, yeah, things transpired that maybe it wasn't, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You kind of mentioned there how, you know, a different in difference in ambitions, maybe mm. what you're looking for long term in life. Um, and eventually the relationship didn't work out, right? Yeah. yeah. So are you single now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I am, yeah. yeah. So obviously you're single, but of course you're coming into the single the single chapter of your life with so many lessons. You know, mm. you kind of I'm, I imagine you kind of know more what you want now in a future husband, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And what are some of the um red flags you look for now in your when you're dating? So I feel like the ambition one is really important. I think especially for women, you know, they can meet guys and they have a bit of a problem perhaps with them doing well and it can be a real blocker. Um, I also think things like control. I've been with guys before. They've been quite controlling and I feel like those are things that you can spot quite early, but a lot of the time, I know I do, look straight past them, almost paint them green and just carry on walking through. But actually those things become quite big things towards the, you know, the middle or the end of a relationship. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, there were some hard moments to watch on your journey on Married at First Sight, notably the discussion around your, Jonathan, who was your husband, um, telling you what you should and shouldn't do in the gym and that he wouldn't necessarily like to date a woman if she put on loads of weight. And a lot of other couples chimed into this conversation and it came became quite a big story on the show. Um It's obviously hyped up for entertainment purposes. Like Mm. anyone should know that from watching the show. But looking back, like what are your thoughts on that whole scenario? Yeah, it it was such a difficult time. It was a difficult time when we were filming because like you said, other couples chimed in. And normally you wouldn't have such strong opinions coming from those around you, especially when you first start dating someone. When do you literally have, you know, loads of other couples, right? We were in these dinner party environments. Any little bit of gossip anyone can get their hands on, they just run with it. But equally, you know, there were people out there definitely trying to protect me. And they definitely saw things that were being said that that weren't acceptable. And I think I definitely was kind of just looking at things like I liked this guy. We had a great honeymoon. We come off the back of that. And I was almost kind of looking past, I think, some of those those comments. But it was like double whammy, uh, you know, months later when it was on television. Mm. And then the media picked it up. So then what happened is, you know, you have people tweeting and they're like, well, you know, I think she is a bit chubby for him or maybe, Mm. you know. For real? Yeah. Wow. So I had people are so rude. I know, and 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 I felt in a really good place going on to that show. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was like working out almost every day and dieting and all of that, which is not necessarily the right thing to do. But I felt really good. And then to come and out, you looked of it, amazing. Can I just point that out there? Because you did. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then to have that happen when it's not even comments you've made, I think that's what's difficult. Someone else has narrated 
a journey that you're having, which is about body image. And I feel like, especially for, you know, women growing up, girls growing up, I went to an all girls school. It's something that's so prevalent, you know, as a teenager and going into your twenties, it's a massive thing to deal with. It takes up so much yeah. headspace without anyone else sort of commenting on it as well. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that must've been really tough to have someone commenting on it, but then it becoming the whole topic of discussion around a dinner table. Like, mm -hmm. how did you get through those times? Gosh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there was just some something like that was driving me to get through it. I feel like we, you know, we did have a connection in there. We did like each other. And I think that kind of like helped carry us through because if we didn't, you know, we'd have left. I don't think I would have been able to, to handle that. But I think when it was just me, you know, sat on the sofa watching, you know, the programme and then it would all kick off on social media and I'd wake up and there'd be something in the Daily Mail or something. Like even now, if I get a picture of me in a dress or whatever, I'll get comments about my weight or the way that I look. And I, don't, I ignore it. It's fine. But I just think it's so difficult because I always say like I'm a very, I hate the word normal, normal size. But mm -hmm. it must be difficult for girls to kind of look at that and think, but I don't look like that. I must be this. It's it's a really difficult discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a difficult thing to navigate for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think you're quite lucky in the sense that you have a, a great self-worth, you know, but for people who may find it more difficult, you know, either they're um, not so secure in their relationships, they have insecurities themselves or mm -hmm. they have generally low self-worth. Um, what would you, what would you, what would, what would be your advice for someone um, like that? Especially when mm. being in such situations, hearing such comments, especially from your partner, but also like the wider community as well. That can be really tough, but what would be your advice for someone? Yeah, I think social media, number one, is not real life. And all mm. of these, you know, incredibly beautiful women that you see just from a picture that isn't what's going on inside their head necessarily. And, and, and for a lot of women as well, like the amount of editing that goes on out there, honestly, I feel like you have to surround yourself by people that lift you higher. And, you know, you wouldn't ever usually like look to other people for that validation, but that's kind of what social media is about. But I think it's about, you know, like coming off the show, I felt incredibly, like I lost my self-confidence massively and I've built that back up again and I'm in a really good place with it now. But it's it's completely normal to have, you know, peaks and troughs with how you feel about yourself and, you know, your, your self-worth. But I think it's important to identify when someone's not making you feel good about yourself and it can be a really difficult thing to do. But I feel like if there's anything telling you, like a little niggling voice that says, actually, you know, they're not making you feel good or they're making comments about what you're wearing or, or you shouldn't, you know, have your hair like that or wear that or that doesn't look good on you then maybe they're not the right person to have in your life and have those comments surrounding you mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more I think it's really important but it's sometimes quite hard to step away mm -hmm. from those situations it can be sometimes harder to be like yeah I don't want to spend my time around this person but actually removing yourself from the situation can be like a whole another mm. ball game um for those looking to get married in their 20s <laughs> i.e me I'm, I'm engaged um what have you learned from the experience of marrying a stranger that you know we could take through into our own experiences oh I mean overall it was a positive experience I think compromise is the biggest thing I'd never lived with anyone with a partner before ever so to kind of get put in that environment straight away I feel like we were quite good at setting boundaries and I think that's a good thing to do you know with the person that you're with is setting those boundaries of like what that looks like living together what marriage looks like I mean the word marriage is such a big word and obviously the way I did it is very unconventional but obviously for you you're engaged you know you love that person you're going into that relationship it's like the next amazing step in your life so I don't think there's you know it's hard for me to say because it's a bit unconventional but I think it's just about compromise and it's about being respectful of one another and you know I think taking the space you need as well when you're on top of someone 24 7 I feel like you need your own friends you need your own space and then it makes things a bit easier. We've teamed up with our sponsors, Zopa Bank, to tell you a little bit more about their Smart Saver account. Yeah, here at Talk20s, we're big fans of the Smart Saver, but we all use it in different ways. So I thought I'd share how I use my Smart Saver account today. Are you saving for some big goals this year? I am actually. I am having, a, well, I've got a wedding to plan in 2024. So I've definitely got some saving goals there. Mm. Um, I'm also going to Paris with my best friend. So I've definitely got a pot for that in my Smart Saver. So I've got a few different pots going on in there. Um, 
Um, some of them I use boosted pots, which is basically where you can put a notice period on your pot, which means you'll get a higher interest rate. But when you want to take the money out of that pot, you um, have to give a notice period. So that might be seven, might be 31, 95 days, but the longer the notice period, the higher the interest rate. Um, I find that really good though, because I'm a person that likes to, used to dip into my savings quite a lot. So I find that quite a good thing. But yeah, I've got some good goals this year that I'm really excited and need to start saving for. That's really interesting. I know I'm interested. And if you are too, and you want to understand more about the Smart Saver account, then download the Zopa app. We do need to tell you that boosted interest pots are subject to a notice period, the longest of which is 95 days for the highest interest rate. You need to save a minimum of one pound and the interest is paid monthly and is subject to variation. Was there, is there anything that you would have done differently how, if you had that experience again? Hmm. <laughs> um, I always say, you know, no regrets. And I do look back on the experience. I mean, it was a massive whirlwind. And I think that I dealt with things in there. How, And I'm proud of myself for the way I handled myself. But I do think there were times where I kind of would have wanted to have said more or maybe got my my point across in a different way. Um, but you can look back on anything and, and feel like that. But I think, yeah, being being more vocal in certain scenarios and standing up for myself and, mm-hmm. you know, what I, what I believe in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you still friends with anyone who was on the show like has anyone has has it changed your life in terms of friendships in any kind of way because we know that it didn't (laughs) didn't work out with Jonathan um yeah absolutely I've got some amazing friends and we always joke you know we didn't get married but we definitely got some amazing Mm. friendships and it's funny you know some people that I I, I'm closer with people now that I wasn't as close with on the show and we do loads together you know we spend birthdays together we go on trips together um and it's really really lovely and I think the major thing is it's it's amazing talking to my friends about, um, you know, what happened, but sometimes I don't want to reflect on it with them and they don't understand. And that's fine. You know, I don't expect them to, but sometimes you need a chat with someone that's done the show and knows how crazy it is and has felt those emotions because, yeah, it's a very Mm -hmm. crazy thing to go through and the emotions sometimes just come back and I think, oh my gosh, but Mm. yeah. Are any of the couples still together from your season? Uh, Zoe and Jenna. Yeah, I absolutely love them. I know, they are amazing, really amazing. Well, hopefully they keep going strong. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Love that. Oh, thanks so much, Sophie. It's really interesting to hear about your experience on Married at First Sight and, you know, we only get the televised version, so it's great to get an insight what it actually is being on the show. But of course, you're a lot more than Sophie that went on Married at First Sight, right? Um, you moved to Manchester to pursue a career in tech and mm-hmm. you also advocate for other women wanting to break into the industry. Um, what would be your advice for women that, you know, want to break into tech or other um, predominantly male dominated spaces? Yeah, I yeah, I love that question. I feel like for me, I, I went into the tech industry when I was 19. And although that was, gosh, yeah, eight years ago now, a lot's changed. And I think fundamentally, It's a, you know, these kind of industries, especially tech, are such exciting places to be. And there's so much space for women to be involved in them. Um, I think it's just about having, you know, confidence and and there's so many opportunities and it shouldn't be, I always say, you know, education and gender and industry shouldn't be a drawback. Um, You know, if anything, there's, like I said, yeah, so much space for women in these industries. And I think, yeah, tech especially has some incredible apprenticeships, you know, like early careers, you can go into like coding roles or even, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, there's loads. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Loads of opportunity. Um, another thing that you kind of have recently opened up quite a lot about on social media, um, kind of post being on Married at First Sight, um, is about having ADHD and being diagnosed whilst you're on Married at First Sight. So being diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience? Why you kind of felt like, you know, I think I've got ADHD and how that all kind of came about? Because I know there's a bit of a story behind it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So... I, well, it was going backwards. It was lockdown. Everybody started working from home, which I was not used to at all. I was uh, every day in the office. And then suddenly I had to work for eight, nine hours sat at my desk. And honestly, I I literally sat there. And the first day I was like, how do people do this? How are they concentrating for that amount of time? Not getting distracted, getting everything done. And I was like, this is more than just me getting a little bit distracted or going on my phone. I was like, this is actually really hard. And a few people had said to me, which I always say, I always see it as a huge positive. A few people said that had ADHD themselves, 
I think you have it and the way that you work, Mm -hmm. you know, you show those kind of symptoms or the way, you know, like I'm always clicking around my screen, like jumping from thing to thing. So I just thought I'm going to, I'm going to explore this because why not try and get the help that you need? Even if it's just a diagnosis, you know, whether you're going to explore any kind of medication or anything, sometimes it's just better to know. So I put myself, um, yeah, on the NHS list, got referred two years later uh, while I was in maths, I got the call. I got a voicemail to say, you know, you've reached the top of the list. Can you come into Manchester? mental health hospital and we'll do, you know, our, um, consultation. And I went through that process and yeah, I, I got diagnosed over summer, literally just after we finished filming at age 26. And I thought it's so weird how you can live, you know, your whole life and adult life. And then suddenly you get kind of like branded as something, Mm -hmm. but for me, and I know it's different for everyone. So I do understand that it's, it's never really been hugely negative. It's always been really positive. I haven't seen it in like this kind of light of, you know, I'll get diagnosed with something that's kind of holding me back. It's almost like, well, I've dealt with it for this long by myself. If anything, this is an opportunity to kind of learn more about it, connect with other people that have ADHD as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's hugely important and perhaps try and help myself, you know, when it comes to work, when it comes to, you know, where I really struggle in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And that diagnosis process then, what kind of questions were they asking you? Because I think for a lot Mm -hmm. of people who maybe think, I really relate to what Sophie is saying. Like, what was the process? And like, how do they decide, yes, you have ADHD or no, you don't think it is this? <laughs> so, well, the first thing was an online form and I spent ages filling out this online form and then the form reset and I lost all of my questions. Oh, so no. as an ADHD <laughs> oh, wow. person, sure. I told them that when I went to the appointment because honestly, it was so frustrating. But once I'd done that, I went and had, I think it was an hour and a half or two hours, the first appointment. Um, and it was so many questions. You go back to your childhood, which I initially didn't think that I was really kind of that ADHD prone or had that many symptoms as a child. I was quite well behaved. You know, I did all right in school. And then when I actually went back, I thought, no, I did struggle in those classes or I did struggle with those tasks. So it's it's super interesting. And then you kind of like move through your life and then you look at certain areas like, you know, social skills uh, in work, like completing tasks. So they'll ask, you know, things about focus or See, I'll forget all the things that they... <laughs> Brain fog. There's just so many things. <laughs> Honestly, it was so many questions. And it's interesting because you can do, you can do, you know, tests online. My doctor sent me one to do online first so that they could kind of gauge as to, you mm. know, perhaps whether I had it or not. And then they referred me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of questions. Mm. And then I had an initial consultation and that was kind of like a, a, a junior person. But I said at the end, I was like, so come on, what do you think? Um, and they were <laughs> like, yeah, I can't diagnose you, but I think potentially yeah. you do. Mm-hmm. And then I had another one with the psychologist and you're basically, you're either um, inattentive ADHD or hyperactive. And hyperactive is the one, that's what people think like kids are, oh, yeah. you're hyperactive and that's it. But I'm a mix of both, which is a lot of people and a lot of women kind of tend to be that way inclined as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because I'm not diagnosed yet, but I am probably (laughs) Sophie at that beginning of that two years Mm -hmm. where I've had the discussion with my doctor and I filled out the form and they're like, okay, we're going to put you forward and now I'm on a list. Mm. So I'm just waiting. So I have no idea like technically, but everything that you say (laughs) relates to me in so many different ways. And it's weird because looking back, there are certain really telltale signs that I should have should have really mm. pointed out but only now reflecting back can I go mm, that makes a lot of sense mm. mainly the fact that I could not revise to save my life yeah. like and I used to always say I'm eldest of four kids my youngest brother and sister used to run around the house oh, it's just like I can't concentrate when there's a house like that but I could sit down with my dad and if he read out like yeah. the questions and quizzed me on it I could do it that way because I had like you know <laughs> someone holding me accountable but any other sit down and revision I found com- so, so, so hard. And mm. the same in university, you know, they set you that reading mm. piece of paper that you're supposed to read. I don't know how many of them I read, but not very many. Like I just used to go in and wing it. And somehow through my personality, I'd be like, yeah, I know the questions or I'd read one paragraph and manage to get through. Got a first in my degree, Ooh. still managed that with, with ADHD. But it explains a lot of my life and I'm no way, no, nowhere near getting a diagnosis. Mm. But I think for me, it's quite reassuring to see people out there who I consider to be completely normal or normal to me anyway, or just, you know, mm. but who are technically, it's, it, it, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but technically mm. you, you're labeled disabled, mm. but like, I can't really see it as a disability. What's your view on that kind of side of things? Yeah. Do you know, it's really interesting. And I think 
it's interesting in itself because obviously everybody has it, I suppose, to varying degrees. And yeah. also ADHD goes alongside other neurodivergent kind of, or, you know, autism. Mm-hmm. There's so many different things that kind of go hand in hand. Now, I feel like obviously for me, I just have ADHD. And like I said, I'm I'm like high functioning. So mm-hmm. I do my job. I get it done. It kills me on the inside, but I do, I do it. And I do yeah. it competently. I've had so many people though. It's funny because you have the people that say, oh yeah, I think you have it. And then you have the other people that are like, you don't have it. You yeah. obviously don't have it. And I've had that so many times. And I think, well, you're not inside my brain. So you don't yeah. know that. And just because I'm good at masking it, which again, um, you yeah. know, guys do it as well, but it's, it's, it is females do it a lot because yeah. they, they don't know that they're dealing with this ADHD and they almost just, you know, put it into their normal routine and they just think that it's like, it's just them basically. Um, but yeah, I feel like women mask it especially, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that you're not struggling. It just means that you're good at pretending you're fine. Yeah, I think mm. it's good to see role models in the media who are outspoken about it as well mm. because it's funny because I did exactly that to my brother. I was like, so I'm like going through the process of like getting diagnosed mm. with ADHD. Like I spoke to my doctor and he went, what? He was like, <laughs> it's not have ADHD. And I was like, no, like I was like, this is like what I kind of experienced because he was obviously thinking about naughty schoolboy, yeah. all of these kind of things. Mm. And he went to me, oh, do you mean like Liv Atwood off of Love Island? And she like openly talks about her ADHD. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, like like that. And he goes, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense how you could be similar in that kind of way. And I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah. so the more people that are outspoken about it, the yeah. better in my opinion. So I think it's great that you're you're talking about it on your platform because it's helped me. So I'm sure it'll help many other people. <laughs> it's, I tell you what, I think that that's, for me, that I, I love having a platform for that reason. I feel like it's so important to talk about these things. And especially as I'm like, people would think I don't have it or or anything like that. And they kind of see that I'm performing in work or whatever. I think it's important, especially in tech. There's so many neurodivergent people in tech. Mm -hmm. And I get messages as well. Just, it it might even be parents and they've noticed it in their kids. And I I had a message recently and they they said, it was, you know, it was crazy to me, but that I'd made an invaluable difference in their life because because of what I'd said, they'd gone to the doctor and they'd been diagnosed and it made so much more sense Mm -hmm. to them. So I'm not saying, you know, branding anyone that has these symptoms if you don't focus, you know, you get distracted, you have ADHD. It's it's not that at all. It's just talking about it because someone might be sat at home really struggling and not realizing that actually they can get a bit of help for mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. For me, it opened up because we interviewed Ellie Middleton, who you also yeah. know quite well. We interviewed Ellie Middleton on the podcast. And before doing the research for that podcast, I didn't know that I could potentially have ADHD, but I was Mm. living in this kind of world where everything was a struggle. I just thought everyone else struggled. Yeah. So I was going through the research for the episode and then I sat down opposite her and I was like, hmm. And we've since become really good friends. And she was the first person I literally opened up to. And I was like, Ellie, I think like, you know, I might have ADHD. And she was like, Gabs, it would make a lot of sense. Like there's a lot of things that, you you know, that would make a lot of sense. And I think for Mm. me, having those role models, people who are speaking about it, seeing that it's not a bad thing, it can Mm. be, you know, it can be a superpower, it can be a good thing, but then understanding the things that are good and that are bad and challenging about it is really important. So Mm. yeah, um, I love love that you're talking about it. It's really great. Mm. Really interesting. I guess the question from me is just, did anything change when you was diagnosed with ADHD? Obviously you was only diagnosed at 26. So you've Mm. gone like most of your young adult life having this, um, this, don't even want to call it a disability, but having, having mm. ADHD, but not being diagnosed with it. Did anything change? Uh, not for me, but like I say, I always caveat that with, I understand that some people take it as a really big hit. And I mm. understand that. Mm-hmm. I feel like for me, it was more just the definition of what's going on in my brain yeah. and taking that forward however I wanted to. I did experiment with medication and it really didn't work for me. Oh my goodness. I took it one day, you know, I, I should probably take it every day, but I took it one day and I was great in the morning. I was focusing, I was getting my tasks done. I got in the car and drove home and I, I literally cried my eyes out all the way home. It was like this roller coaster mm. of emotions. So I think it, it, there's one thing finding out and there's kind of one thing, the aftermath of like what you then do. And I mean, you know, I, you, you get a level of support, but it, it's very much take this tablet and see how you get on. Mm-hmm. And I'm still kind of like working out, okay, if I don't medicate, how can I help myself? And that might be, you know, using kind of like planners or like just constructing my life a bit better to help myself. Yeah. I think that's what I personally need to do more of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Using mm. iCal literally changed my life. <laughs> you know, I got like a share calendar with my other half. I got a share calendar with you and Georgia. <laughs> like all these different calendars. Before that, I don't even know what my life was, but complete chaos. Yeah. Um, so yeah, productivity apps all the way. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. So Sophie, you're 27, I believe. I did some quick math. You said you've been in tech since she was 19, eight, eight years or so 27 now? Uh, three weeks, uh, two weeks time. One two week time. time. My oh, birthday's a week oh, today. Yeah. <laughs> right down to the... Oh. Yeah. To the, to the <laughs> but yeah, you've obviously experienced so much, you know, mm. you've been on reality TV, you've had this career in tech, you know, mm. so many different phases of your life. I'm just wondering, is there any adult failures that you can look back on and say you've learned from or you just look back and just shake your head and laugh? <laughs> I feel like this is such an interesting question because I was thinking about it and I almost couldn't think of anything that kind of really announced itself as a massive fail. Like I try and think of things as like learning opportunities and mm. flip them on its head. Like I don't regret anything really. And I try not to see things as a fail. Like I'm a massive risk taker. Again, probably sort of ADHD. Like I'm so impulsive. I'd say probably things like spending. Like I'll, like a year ago, I bought the new VR Oculus headset that was like 400 pounds and I've used it once. <laughs> and things like my oven, all that went was the fuse and I bought a whole new oven and I didn't mm -hmm. even realize. Like I just impulsively sort of spend on things that I could probably be a bit more careful about. But on like a more serious note, yeah, I try not to think of things as as like fails. Like I feel like I probably did more stuff in my teens than I did in my 20s. And I feel like once I went into my 20s, I'm very, I like to be in control of, of what I do. So when I make a decision, I can be really indecisive, but you best believe I've looked at every like single angle and kind of made a decision based on what I think is best. So generally I look back on things as a, as a learning opportunity, even if they went a bit wrong, I'm like, mm -hmm. well, it led to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the best way to look at life in general. Mm. Um, one of the things that we love to talk about on the podcast is that no matter what we see on social media, nobody's perfect. Everybody's working through something. Mm. For you, what's one thing that you're working on improving in your life at this moment in time? Oh, that's a good question. I think I mentioned very briefly the control thing. And I think I very much like to be in control of things a lot of the time. And that's not always possible. And you don't always want to be in that position either. You just kind of want to let things happen a lot of the time and great things can come from that. So I think it's just about letting go and letting things happen. Um, and I think not being so hard on myself, like things aren't always perfect all the time. And I feel like, especially last year, going through stuff in the media and kind of seeing things said about yourself that maybe aren't true or just that aren't very nice. It's just about having confidence in yourself. And I think I just want to have that going forwards. And I do feel really positive about this year. I think I'm in a really good place in that sense. But yeah, not being too hard on myself and just, you know, pushing through whatever comes at me, I think. Mm -hmm. And what does the future hold for you? What, have you got any exciting things coming up? Uh I don't know if I can say about <laughs> a couple of things. Um, well, I, yeah, I've got some really exciting work things coming up, um, taking a bit of a different direction in my career, but, but staying in tech. Um, and I think just, I, I've, I've always done like a nine to five and got up every day and like had a salary job and, you know, dropping out of uni. And then when I was 19, literally working. And I feel like I'm finally in a place now where I can actually monetize my own skills, which is an incredible place to be. And I've always mm -hmm. dreamt of, being there. So mm -hmm. it's quite an exciting time. And I think hopefully it'll be the start of something a bit different for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exciting. What you said there sounds so amazing. I think it ties nicely into our final question. You know, you said you dropped out of uni at 19 and like you kind of just went straight into work. Mm -hmm. What's some, what's one piece of advice you'd give your 20 year old self or so maybe a year from there, but I can mm -hmm. imagine you're still kind of in the same, same headspace. What's one piece of advice you'd give 20 year old Sophie? Oh, I think... Buy some Bitcoin. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think the the being aware of yourself, but not being too hard on yourself. I think when I was that age, especially, I cared what everyone thought about me all the time. And I think as you get older, an incredible thing happens where that just starts to go away and you have faith in yourself. But I think when you're that young, and especially, you know, there's probably people in a similar position where they're going into like a corporate world or just a work world and they're very young, you're completely capable of doing that. Trust yourself and your ability because it, it's what will get you far. Like I managed to get really far. And if I'd have had a bit more faith in myself, and confidence you know I think I'd have just enjoyed the ride a bit more mm -hmm. 
100%. I think a lot of us struggle and internalize a lot of things in our 20s. We overthink a lot of things. And actually, like, it is a lot about enjoying the ride and yeah. just, yeah, experiencing the joy that is our 20s. Well, thank you, Sophie. It's been amazing to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining us on our Valentine's episode. Um, sending lots of love to you guys listening at home. Hope you have a wonderful day whenever you're listening to this episode. And thanks for tuning in to Talk 20s. A big thank you to you, yes you, for tuning into this episode of the Talk 20s podcast. We hope it inspired you in some way and popped a little pep in your step for this week. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review and share this episode with a friend. It means a lot to us to have your support. We also love hearing your stories and suggestions. You can reach out to us on all socials by searching at Talk 20s. Lastly, before we go, our website talk20s.com is the hub for all things 20-somethings. Go check out my people. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.